All right, this is uh, episode four of the Simple Man Wrestling Podcast. Uh, Sean O'Rourke uh, is unable to make it this week. He's super busy. Um, he's uh, getting caught up on some work-life stuff. Uh, but I do have a special guest. I have uh, Matt Montero. Uh, Matt Montero, uh, you might have to help me out with some bio stuff. So I, I found your LinkedIn profile. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out what exactly do you do and where, where do you work? Um, for Bragg Crane Service. So um, he's actually probably a little older than you, but Kellen Bragg wrestled at Cal Poly, but um, big crane company. And I head up the wind, like renewable energy division. So all over the Western United States chasing after big crane work um, on the big wind turbines, like you see out in Mojave Tatchby all over. So Yeah. And how'd you get into that? Um, Ever since college, I've been in some form or another of like uh, construction kind of sales and project management. And then I had a little bit of overlap with Kellen when he came in as a freshman. I was the grad, like a volunteer grad assistant at Cal Poly the year after I graduated. And so he was an upper weight guy. I worked with him a little bit. And then he actually ran into Ryan Halsey, who you know. And then yeah. they called me one night. They were they were out and hanging out. And Kellen's like, hey, I want to come meet with you. I want you to come work, work for me. And so like the next week he came up had the meetings, made an offer, the rest is history. Nice. Uh, and then what, I mean, so a lot of times, like guys will get jobs that have nothing to do with your, your bachelor's degree with their degree. What was your mm -hmm. degree at, at Cal Poly? Yeah, nothing at all. Social sciences and criminal justice concentration, like a like kind of like the, it's Cal Poly's version of kind of like pre-law. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I was real limited on what I could choose as my degree when I left Cal State to go to Cal Poly because Cal Poly's in my opinion, they're, they're kind of arrogant, so they don't accept a lot of classes. <laughs> so <laughs> they, so a bunch of majors and a bunch of units didn't count when I was transferring. So it like made it real difficult. And I was very limited. So that was kind of the one that seemed the most academic and maybe I could turn into something. Did you, did you want to be a cop like before that? No, or I, ne I, I never did. I mean, well, I take that back. Originally, one of the original plans was maybe going to be able to go into like corrections and then use my degree and work up into like upper management, get out of the custody stuff, get up into counseling and associate warden type stuff. But uh, at a certain point, like my brother does that and it's a, yeah. it's a great career and they take care of you, but um, there's also knocks on that career spending a lot of time around not so many great people. And so um, just decided to go a different route. And, I got into kind of a new business sales to start, and then it's more turned into project management, account management. And, um, man, I hate to be cliche, but like when you tie into wrestling, if you have a competitive nature and a good work ethic, um, it seems to be really easy to be really good at jobs like this. So, yeah, I know uh, a couple guys. Um, I know like, like Carl Salesman and um, uh, some other guys, like, you know, Sheets, like he sells insurance and he, yep. he, he would say that he sells other things too. Like he sells like, <laughs> you know, not, not like a drug thing or anything, but you know what I mean? Like, like, yeah. you know, it's like, a, that's all encompassing, like wanting to help people and, and stuff like that. And um, I think uh, kind of like how you said, when you take that wrestling mindset and it gets kind of competitive, especially if you're in a good work environment where you have mm -hmm. people around you that are also trying like you're competitive with, it's like, yeah, they're also like your teammates, but like, you also like, you know, you want to have, you know, better results than, than maybe they do. So, um, I, mean, so I take it personal. Like I look at our competitors in the crane industry, if they get a job from me, it's like, they beat me, you know, <laughs> I, I can these are the people you work with. No, I'm saying our competitors. Like if I oh. lose a project to a competitor, I get, <laughs> I get mad. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. I want to get them Would on the next one. Uh, you know, um, it's a tight knit industry. It's small enough to where like, there's a lot of people that worked for us that are now with the competitor and there's a couple of like strong rival competitors. So I mean, I do everything I can to not let them have any job in my territory. <laughs> and so it's, um, it honestly makes it fun, man. When you're post athlete and it's a way to, and your paycheck is the, somewhat determined by it as well. So, you, you know, you're, you're invested in uh, winning more than you lose. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you, you started wrestling, uh, what age? Four. My dad's a wrestling coach. So I was born on a dang wrestling mat. I used to, I mean, there's old stories, pretty fun about them, like throwing me across the room and sliding me on the mat all the way across the room. And, um, kind of the same with my boy, Ty, like he used to, we used to lay his little kid blinky down on the mat and he'd sleep on that while I was running wrestling practices. Actually, while I was still like in college those last couple of years. So my dad finally had me start competing in like the five and six year old division, like at four years old. And um, 
and then never stopped from there. And just all the way through, always wrestled me up age groups and up weight classes. Yeah. So your dad was your coach or he was your coach and your father at the same time. And you're kind of doing the same thing with Ty and Carson. Um, maybe talk about like, I mean, I know for me personally, I'm not sure if I could coach my kids uh, just because I mean, you know who I am a little bit. And sometimes I get a little icy um, and uh, I'm not sure. I, I'd like to think by the time I have kids, I'd be able to handle that. Um, but you have both like kind of grown up with it and, you know, you're doing it now as a parent. Um, so maybe talk about that relationship and, uh, maybe how is it different? How is it similar? And then how have you learned just, you know, through the whole process of coaching Ty and you coach with Carson? Yeah, it's funny. I just had that convert like this, uh, kind of a little bit about this. And I was talking about how I pride myself on having perspective, having wrestled all the way through college and understanding that the, you know, the early stages, it's not so much on results as far as, as much as development and uh, enjoying the sport and finding a love for it. But there's no doubt being right out of college and, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but full of piss and vinegar and uh, had a young kid and I was super motivated. And uh, I probably, I might've even told you this before, almost ruined the sport for Ty. I was just all over him, you know, wanted perfection at a very young age from him. Um, would tell him I didn't, it didn't matter if he won or lost, but when he won, I was celebrating and happy. And when he, when he lost, I'm mad and disappointed and shaking my head and, um, and so there was a certain point, I don't, I don't know the exact moment, but I just realized I have to back off and this kid's going to have to learn to love this sport and want it for himself before he ever takes any leaps and jumps. And then, um, and then his freshman year, he had a real good state meet and kind of a breakthrough. And at that moment, I never like questioned his toughness or his work ethic anymore. It was just more about, you know, teaching him the sport of wrestling and adding intricacies. And I kind of do a lot of the studying for him in terms of his major opponents and, uh, try to come up with game plans but I'd say that day he earned a lot of respect for me and or that throughout that tournament and um with Carson I'm a lot more laid back I mean we were a lot further along at nine years old uh, with Ty than I am Carson and Ty's obviously taking up a lot of my time and my energy but it's been exciting because it's gonna, I think it's gonna be easier one I think I'm better and I have better perspective and I have a I have a I believe a pretty dang good system in place to develop him and bring him along on the fast track. And he admires and loves his brother so much that he's just ready to go. Whatever Ty did to get as good as he is, that's what Carson wants to do. And so it won't be like kind of teaching a pipe dream or kind of saying, Hey, if you do this, we're going to do it. He knows what it takes to get there. He's seen his brother do it. So um, our big thing, like I'm kind of ramping him up, getting him going this year, but the, as soon as, Ty graduates and goes off to college. Um, it's Carson. It's been made known. Carson's my new workout partner, and we've been doing everything to start. You know, we're big on early morning workouts and then afternoon wrestling practices or football practice or whatever sport. And so, um, start putting his head that we train when our opponents sleep. And so, start going to work. Yeah, and Carson. Uh, I always forget how old he is. He's nine. Yep, he's nine. nine. Uh, so the age difference. I'm not great at math, but it's uh, it's nine it's years. Like eight years. Eight yeah. years. Yeah. Ty just turned 18. So I think it might be eight and a half years or something like that. So what's, what's the age difference between you and Mitch? Just uh, like two years and about two and a half years. Yeah. Was, was, so that relationship between Ty and Carson or Carson's kind of looking up to Ty, was that kind of similar between you and Mitch? I would say so. Um, yeah. It, I guess it was Mitchell was just a lot closer to it. He was kind of doing a lot of the stuff with me as opposed to the age gap between Carson and Ty not necessarily able to do everything that Ty's doing, but he has tagged along and he's been around and he's watched it. Um, but shoot, Mitchell, he's such a big guy, a big kid. I mean, he was on a couple of my football teams growing up. He got pulled up to varsity as a freshman my senior year when we were in the championship, in the CIF uh, championships and uh, played, <laughs> beat out a senior for the spot as a freshman. And then um, he was one of my main workout partners my senior year in high school. And then... I redshirted after the two years at Cal State Baker. So when I transferred to Cal Poly and I went back while going to Cal Poly, but basically coached him and was his workout partner his entire senior year of high school. And so um, we were, were more like best buds than like big brother, old, you know, big brother, little brother. So. Yeah. Yeah. So I, have a, I mean, I have a question. So I, obviously you were at um, Cal State Vegas for two years. I want to talk first about like, what was your recruiting process like? <laughs> Uh, come out of high school because you were were you a state champ or a state finalist or senior? No, I got fourth. I got fourth. Yeah, fourth. Yeah, there was um, 
I guess I'll talk on that first. There's only really one guy in the state of California that could, could like that I felt was better than me, and it was Joe Williams out of Calvary Chapel. He was like he was ranked anywhere from one to three in the nation, and uh, I lost to him in the semifinals at five counties. I lost him in the semifinals at Masters, and I lost him in the semifinals at state. Um, and I shouldn't have met him in the state semifinals, but I was throwing such a bad fit after losing him in the Masters semis that I ended up losing my next match and going in for fifth and sixth at Masters to a kid that didn't belong on the mat with me. But I, uh, it was something I had to grow up and learn. I didn't handle losses very well. So it was like I came to this tournament to win. And as soon as I lost, I, I mean, like my dad had to come find me across the campus at Fountain Valley High School. And I was like singlet off, walking, going to walk down the street. <laughs> and they're calling me from, they're calling I get me your singlet? Oh, yeah, pissed off at the <laughs> world. <laughs> so he's like dragging me back to the gym to make me wrestle. And I end up losing, just pouting and feeling sorry for myself. And um, so anyways, I lost to Joe Williams, but... The guy that was in the finals against him, I had like major decision and ripped his shoulder out with a, a legs and power half. And I mean, I just, I was a lot better. So I was the second best kid in the state, but I ended up getting fourth. Um, but interestingly enough, I lost for third and fourth in like a really funky match. I'm not used to wrestling guys taller. This dude's like six foot four, would dig underhooks and just try to push. And um, like with like 12 seconds left, they call a stalling on me and give the guy the win. You know, like shove the guy and trying to like fight and throw my headgear and whatnot. And what's funny about it, I don't know how well you knew Kerr. Did you wrestle for Kerr? Was he still? No, so I think I want to say Kerr passed away uh either the spring or the summer before I got there. Gotcha. So he liked like my feistiness and my attitude. And that's like what struck, you know, struck a chord. And there were some other colleges reaching out to me and um recruiting and we we're kind of playing the game back and forth a little bit and working on money and then uh they came through with a little bit more to get me there so that, uh, but yeah it um it was nice it was close to home um shoot they were only a couple years removed from being eighth in the country well, steve like i think 99 2000 steve mill senior so i was only a couple years out of that and uh we brought in a really good recruiting class like, there was like a good 14 of us and we were we were tough and i i mean had life circumstances been different i would have loved to see that group stay together because pretty dang good by my true sophomore year we were I think 16 and one in duels and the duel we lost we didn't have all our starters in the lineup and we were ranked you know top 16 top 15 in the country and, uh, yeah that was a really tough uh, really tough group um I want to say uh Efren and and um Efren, Matt, Sa Brian Efren Cobb, Matt Sanchez Brad Cobb Roberto Vargas uh yeah. Christian Ariano was a Pac-10 champ or runner-up um this uh, uh, Brian Baza, tough, tough, tough kid, motor. Scott O'Rear, another buddy, buddy of ours, yeah. is on that in that team. Brian Travers, who's around town. It was uh, we were tough, man. We we're, we're good. We were a good team that year. Yeah. So you wrestled for Kerr, um, who is uh, known for being a, a pretty intense guy. And then you go to Cal Poly, and you have Azevedo, who's like kind of soft spoken, like really nice. Like mm -hmm. I, I, I believe it, he probably gets riled up too, but. Um, oh, yeah. Maybe talk about like the differences in coaching styles and coaching philosophies. And then which one do you feel like had, you know, and not necessarily a bigger impact, but do you feel like um, maybe helped you wrestle, uh, I guess, a little more competitively? Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't think there's any doubt that my best wrestling year in, in my career was my true, my second year in college at Cal State Bakersfield. Um, when I coach kids and I talk to them about if they're doing all the right things and, uh, they're training all the doubt and all the weakness out of their minds and their bodies. At a certain point, you start to believe internally that you're invincible and that you can't be beat. If you're in amazing cardiovascular shape and uh, something that I got fortunate enough to do was work alongside Coach Pope um, for about a year straight. Basically, right after my true freshman year ended at Pac-10, him and I just worked together almost every single day, spring and summer and fall rolling into the season. And he is a in my opinion, the best like shot defense system out there. And he developed that trying to stop Steve Mills double, who's like the best in the world and is unstoppable because I tried a few times and ended up on my back. And uh, so in my head going into matches that sophomore year, I would say they can't take me down because they can't finish. They can't get to my legs and I don't get tired and I can't be ridden. So how can I lose? And those are the things that would like run through your head leading into matches. And I just felt, so good and you know that's how you start beating good wrestlers because you just don't fear anybody and, uh, yeah. and then uh so 
Coach John, I still have an amazing relationship with. We're extremely close. One of my biggest mentors in my life and just an amazing human being. Um, definitely different, a lot more technical, a lot more, a lot more detail oriented, a lot more drilling as opposed to live wrestling. And uh, I had Joe Heskett, who was real slippery, slick, uh, kind of hang on you gangly style that I picked up some stuff from. Um, Coach John is huge on positioning and fundamentals and uh, just getting great reps over and over again. So, um, so it's, I don't want to say one's better than the other. I think, I think there's more than one way to skin a cat for sure. Um, yeah. What I'll say is wrestling was life for me at Bakersfield. And when I went to Cal Poly, I had other things going on, you know, I was trying to raise a son. So maybe instead of getting that extra workout in to get that edge, I was hustling back because it was my day with my boy or, um, you know, picking up a side job for a little bit of money. And so, um, I mean, I still had pretty good success at Cal Poly. I was always, you know, I was always top 15, top 12 in the country and played second in the Pac-10s a couple times in the national tournament. But I just wasn't locked in like I was at Bakersfield. And uh, the one big thing that I would say from a different standpoint from Cal State to Cal Poly was just the culture. And Kerr just, yeah. Kerr demanded a certain culture and you just thought it was normal. Like you, it's what you walked into. You just didn't think there was anything else. And it was all we did was wrestle. I mean, man, we had like a week off after NCAAs. You had a week off right when school ended and you had one week to choose throughout the summer to take a few days off. Monday through Thursday, you practice. Fridays were all American Fridays, supposedly optional, but they weren't really optional. And uh, when our season ended, crazy stuff, like we would still run stairs in condition in the spring when the season was over. And it does sound a little asinine, a little bit over the top, but it's like those types of things just start making you feel harder and tougher than everybody else. So um, the culture wasn't quite there at Cal Poly at that time. I mean, it was on its yeah. way and they had some really good individuals, but there's a lot more distraction in the San Luis Obispo than there is Bakersfield too. So. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, I mean, you know, I like, I, I grew up next to the beach. Like I know exactly uh, what, what you're talking about. Um, that's actually like, for me, like when I was getting recruited, that was one of the big deciding factors is, uh, you know, I went to CSU Bakersfield it, for my, it was an unofficial trip, but uh, when I went, those are the only time where the guys didn't try to, <laughs> take me out yeah. um yeah but uh yeah you know you know what's like over there but uh yeah so i mean you had like you did have uh you know some wins and stuff um when you were at cal poly uh i want to say it was in 2005 you were around 12 right mm -hmm. yeah and then you beat uh damian Hahn. is that the year that you won it so i beat Han when i was at bakersfield my sophomore year um uh, and he was the defending national champ and then he won it again that year and I beat the Iowa guy who was in the finals and got second to him at Midlands. And That's not Lee Fullhard, is that? No, he was an 84 pounder and he's a little bit older than me. Um, his name's Ryan Fulsass. And he, so he lost. Yeah, that. I know who that is. Yeah. Um, so I beat him pretty good at uh, Midlands. And then Chris Scrutzkowitz placed that year, fourth or fifth. And I beat him at Midlands. And I'd beaten Bader in our duel, but he had beaten me a couple of times that year as well. Ryan Bader was a little bad matchup for me, but I had a win over him. So it was like, I think four of the top five in the country I'd beaten that year. <laughs> but I did Yeah. Play. So so when people ask you that, like, does that get frustrating? Like, yeah. I mean, I'm sure yeah. I'm at peace with it, you know. Like I think I was a pretty dang good wrestler and um, you know, everything happens for a reason. And shoot, I look at my son and what he's doing, and it's like it was all meant to be this way. You know what I mean? And um uh, you know. I, like I said, I don't have anything to prove to anybody. And even when I'm, you know, I coach these kids, I'm, I'm not out there for my own ego. I'm not out there to, you know, do anything for myself. It's just because I want them to reach their goals. And so, um, yeah, I'm, a, I'm like I said, I'm at peace with it. I worked real hard. I got out of it. I got, you know, I got an education out of it for essentially for free. And um, I love the sport. And it's one of those things you just continue to grow and continue to add. And man, I know so much more about it now than I did when I was wrestling in college. And, um, but yeah, so I mean, people ask all the time, like with my brother, who's who's a better wrestler? Well, he plays in the country. I didn't, so he is. <laughs> and uh, it's it, it, that's one cool thing about wrestling. It's not like discretionary. There's no like who this, who that, or who do you think? It's like no, it's just results driven. That's why that's why I love it so much. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's interesting. Like uh, people, people ask me because uh, you know I work at the school and my brother works at the same school, so mm. they're like, well, who wins in a wrestling match? You know, and. Uh, if I, if it was a younger version of myself, you know, I would I would say very much outright uh, who wins in a wrestling match. But um, uh, 
uh, you know, now that I'm a little bit older, uh, I'm like, oh, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, you didn't ask that question. Yeah. But um, yeah, I would definitely beat my brother in a wrestling match. So, <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's I, because he just gets tired and he's old. And yeah, he's Mitch and I field those questions a lot. Everybody wants to know. And, uh, you know, I used to entertain it here and there. And now it's like, Honestly, it doesn't matter because it's him and me versus everybody. So <laughs> like, yeah. we're on the same team. Yeah. So, um, you know, but yeah, when we when we're hanging out, we're all as a family, it always usually turns into some type of little wrestling match scuffle. I got a broken bar on one of my couches to prove it. So <laughs> <laughs> we always have some fun. So when you when you wrestled, um, you know, we kind of just talked about it a little bit. So you had Kerr. Uh, how was Kerr in the corner? Because I feel like when when there's, there's so much you can do like with with training and stuff, but I know like for sometimes like there was a couple guys, uh, there's a couple of matches for us this last weekend. We have some freshmen and like getting you know overtime matches and like they need to go get a takedown, and like they're not used to like people on the sidelines going crazy. And like there was a couple moments where he pulled through, but there were somewhere like there got a little bit, you know, crap. I've never been in this kind of moment before, mm -hmm. um, and I feel like a, a, a coach giving the right energy. Um, goes a long way. So maybe yeah. talk about, you know, from your perspective on that. So I think Kerr was a big guy that just believed effort and fight was what was the difference. <clears throat> Not so much technical stuff. He had like a few things from a few positions that he like demanded. So like if somebody threw legs, you were to sit them and go to their head and like now, and he'd freak out if you didn't. And, um, but it was usually like wrestle and fight harder. So nothing like too, Great, but what he did do, he brought an intensity and he brought, um, you know, a passion to it. And uh, something I always respect, which I try to remember myself as a coach now, is yeah. he would never talk to the refs. There's no, no matter what the call was, how bad it was or nothing, he was solely focused on you and wrestling your match and doing what you're supposed to do. So there was no complaint of the ref. There's no call into the table. There's no feeling sorry for yourself. You got a bad call. It was just on to the next thing. Um, so I thought that was kind of something respectable because, man, there's times where I want to go after these refs bad and I'm trying to contain myself um but Mendoza always provided like that calming presence and would give you some technical stuff same thing with coach Pope if he's in the corner um but things like coach Kerr there's just certain things that he stood for and his 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 belief in the program and the system that he had in place that um stick with you forever um I mean I won I beat Damian Hahn in that match and I jumped up and I wanted to celebrate and like pump my fist and he like yelled at me I mean, this is like seconds after the match act like you've been here before and it was like you know act like you expected to win it was one of those types of things and it was like you know what you're right like I've trained hard I did believe I could win this match and uh, there ain't no reason to act all excited and you know whatever and so some of his principles like that I really um, respected and appreciated and just like I said we like I know Iowa's gotten you know um, a uh, identity for being like the hardest working team and there's a few others or they were even more so back when I was in school but I would venture to, I would bet that nobody worked. The the couple of years I was at Cal State, so there wasn't a team in the country working on it. Like I, I, I feel I like when you're, when you're at that level, right, I, I feel like, because um, I know uh, Steve Mako, when he transferred from Iowa to Oklahoma State, you know, there was this, again, he came from, you know, the the brands and Zaleski's that, you know, we're hard, we're tough, whatever. We work really hard. But then when they go to the, you know, Oklahoma State room, it's like, yeah, the training is a little bit different, but it's like, they work hard too. You yeah, know, and like Oklahoma State's more technical. Well, yeah, but there's technique at Iowa too. There's not like there's no technique. Yeah. So I feel like with with most programs, you know, yeah, like I, I feel like it's it's hard to be at that level and compete and not work hard. Like it's it's just the bare minimum. One hundred percent. And I think uh, we probably had to be a little more resourceful. So like Mendoza, he had just came back, and my first year there was his first year at Cal State. Was was at, out of the state before that, right? Yeah, and so. I mean, he was awesome and he had some things that he was really good at. He would kind of reemphasize drills and positioning. Um, you know, one occurs thing was stand ups on the wall. We freaking did stand ups on the wall every single day. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was just always an intense drill in my wrestle. But then you had like something like Coach Pope would offer up some of his stuff, which he demanded perfection, like on your penetration shots and your double legs, something I would do with him after practice every single day. And uh, his whole cover the head and uh, heavy hips system for his go behinds is just like I mentioned earlier, is just I haven't came across anything better. And, um, you know, like Matt Sanchez worked um, Gene Mills camp over a summer and came back 
And so if you wanted to learn, you'd pick some of these brains. So he would stay with me after practice. And I learned Gene Mills whole half series. And that year, I think Sam, I think, I know he uh, led the nation in pins with like 27 pins a senior year. Uh, in the country. And, uh, so that's a system that I learned from him. And then I've talked to my son and other kids I've coached. And so we're a little more resourceful on where we could get the technique because Coach Kerr definitely wasn't a uh, technical coach. It was just like, you know, hit the head and shoot and go and just stand up. He, I mean, I can't have just stand up. And it's like, if it was only that easy, like that you just <laughs> to stand up. Yeah. Sometimes there's a people doing stuff on you. Um, but uh, yeah, so it was a combination, you know, between that, the coaching staff, the assistant coach, you know, Kobe Wright would come in and, you know, if you want to learn how to do some leg riding and uh, you know, a bunch of alumni would come back and beat on you and teach you something. And, uh, but dang it, man, we worked hard. I, I just don't think you could work much harder than, than what we did in terms of a combination of very, very hard practices with very, very hard running and very, very hard lifting. I mean, we were just, we were just hard. And it was all yeah. you, you didn't have a choice. You were either you guys right or one on the team. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, I want to say, because uh, it was kind of the same way my freshman year. Um, it, I, it was it was interesting because when I got to CSUB, it was Mendoza was the head coach and Roscoe was the assistant. So Bios mm -hmm. was there. Um, and uh, we ran. Uh, up until January 1st, like we ran the course two days a week and then we did stairs in yep. the morning. So, and we Very did that similar. until the end of the season. Um, and then my next year, it's like, we ran, we still ran the course, um, but then uh, we didn't really run stairs. And then uh, the year after that, when Rivera came in, like we, you know, we'd run the course maybe like every now and then, um, but we never ran stairs. And it's interesting. And just looking around at like some of these other college teams, um, like they say Penn state, like doesn't lift, that much they don't run that much and that's what they say of course like um i'm still waiting for like somebody to go that we know into the penn state room and like be on the team and then like when they come out now we can start like dissecting all the stuff uh, that's in there but yeah i don't um, believe that's entirely true and a little yeah. bit from knowing like through uh varner and andy and frank knowing jake well and talking to him and then the other thing I'd say is if they don't look at something like david taylor who got on with uh the guy in socal and RBY and a lot of those guys that do, um, gosh dang it, what's his name? It's um, like mental training, right? Is that the same guy that uh, – No. No? No. Um, he's right down here. Coach John Asvito knows him real well too. Sam Calavita is his name. I'm trying to think of his uh, – what his business is called. Now he's, he's blowing up. So he's like training the Penn State team, a lot of these the Penn State graduates. And they'll be – he does like TJ Dillashaw and Pico. There's a bunch of them. Yeah. Uh, the lap is a – the training lab, T R E I G. Oh, I know. It's yeah, it's yeah, it's like rain, the train. Yeah, training lab. I actually wanted to get tied down there, and Coach John was going to set it up, and we just kind of never followed through. Um, but yeah, so like all those guys, he does like weight training, spin cycle, you know, carrying heavy bags and ropes, and you look like the muscle and like you know the physicalness that something like David Taylor's put on his body. You, there's. I think a heavy importance for strength training and cross training. You can't just wrestle all the time, you know, um, and hard enough. And the other thing is, I think like it's why is drilling so much harder than wrestling because you can kind of enforce reps and repetition. Like wrestling, you could take somebody down and ride them and not work real hard. And you know, it's right. sometimes as a coach you have to monitor all the time and like get back up or you know, turn them, cut them. Like we're trying to score points. Or shorten the goes, you know, or, yes. or change like the starting point. Yeah, so I, you know, why do you do some sprints after practice? Because it's a maximum effort. It's a maximum effort thing that completely blows your lungs out if, if the kids are going as hard as they possibly can. So um, I believe, like, some of that stuff's important. Whether, you know, hey, if Penn State's won a bunch of national titles and they're not doing it, great. But I don't know if I believe that's true, but I could be wrong. So. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a good point, too. You know, just because one team or an individual is doing a really good job at this one thing doesn't mean you need to completely change everything. Um, I do think though it's important because I, I, I feel like, and this is, um, this is something that I, I feel like comes from kind of like the Gable area and that, that, that kind of coaching tree where people see, you know, Iowa just trains really hard and they're running, you know, uh, laps around Carver or Hawkeye arena and they're running upstairs and they just wrestle live all the time and they go really hard. And that's kind of like the outward perception of people that aren't in the program. So when you see that either you start, you start thinking like, okay, well, we just need to wrestle hard. We just need to be tough. 
And there's a lot more to wrestling than just being tough. And, you know, this is coming from something I like, all I had was, I was tough. I wasn't technical. <laughs> I, didn't, you know, I didn't even really learn how to wrestle until like my third or fourth year of college, you know? Yeah. And I would even say maybe after college, I actually learned like positioning and stuff. Um, but I, yeah, I just kind of come back to um, what we were talking about. Like, I think you need to train hard, but you also need to train smart. And I think training hard at the same rate, the same intensity during the whole season, I'm not sure that's something that is going to help you have success at the end of the year. If you're just going like this the whole time. I'd agree with that. And, um, you know, something if I was going to fault what we did at Cal State Bakersfield was we trained really hard all season. And then Coach Kerr would try to, like, pick it up for the guys going to Pac-10s and Nationals. So, like, one of the hardest things I tell people – I tell people I believe I had the hardest Iron Man. I probably already told you this because anytime we talk wrestling, but I believe I had the hardest hardest Iron Man that anybody could ever have. And our Iron Man's at Cal State Vegas so were a three minute go, a minute of sprinting, a three minute go, a minute of sprinting. With, oh, each goes with a different person. So a second three minute go with a minute of sprinting, then a third person comes in three minute go, a minute of sprinting, and then that guy you have a sudden victory takedown with which person you want with third. And so in this order, I went Steve Neal, Coach Pope, and Coach Lou Montano <laughs> for my Iron Man. And so. <laughs> And you would do like two or three rounds of those in a practice. And Coach Kruis, I was like the greatest thing ever. Well, I will say that I do think if you didn't self-manage like your workload a little bit, you were starting to wear down at the end of the year. And not to mention your like pride and ego because you just get mauled for nine minutes straight by these guys. Yeah. And so, um, you know, we just had to talk with our guys um, that were coaching um, – kind of felt like some of them were trying to back off their training and not lift as hard a little bit because we had our first competition this weekend. It's like talking about that there's a method to the madness and that we have a plan in place to be at our best at the end of the year. And, but it's not their job to start tapering or worrying about a competition. We're not going to peak and taper and take training days off for every competition leading up. Hey, we got a couple of big dates that we have in mind. And then, um, but the goal is to keep ramping up and getting tougher and working harder and getting better do the necessary backing off of the intense training, you know, for the postseason. So we just had that talk with our guys. Um, yeah. Do you feel like it's of, been a, go ahead. Sorry. I was just saying, I think some of them were, Oh, I had a tournament Saturday. I can't train hard. I can't lift hard or, Oh, I'm losing a few pounds. It's like, no, we're, we're, we're training through this little tournament. <laughs> so Yeah. Um, well, I think too, like, uh, what's different about college and high school, just, just coaching and, and training in general is like when you're in college, it's like, I, I feel like and maybe the rules have kind of changed a little bit um, that, uh, or maybe they haven't changed, uh, but they're definitely being enforced a little bit more uh, just from what I've seen um, just on how often you can train and like what kind of training you can do and stuff like that. Um, but in high school, it's like, you know, you have to fit, like you have this, you know, giant full day of, of school and uh, you can train before school, you can train after school, and then you can get stuff in on the weekends. Um, but when we look at like, you know, what you're like, you can only as control as a coach, like you can only control that practice time. Like I can't, I can't go in their classroom and freaking be like, hey, you need to be doing the right things. Or um, I might see kids at lunch and stuff. Uh, but I, I think like the, the biggest role or the most important piece of coaching high school is buy-in from your parents. Because those are the people that like, I can't like, you know, if you're messing around, like I can maybe punish you on the wrestling mat, or whatever, but like, I can't like ground you. I can't take away your Xbox. Cause you, you know, you're up late playing Xbox or something during a weekday. Like, I feel like, um, you know, when you have that buy-in from the parents, like you have something really special. So when you're talking about, you know, uh, training hard, especially right after a tournament, the kids feel a certain way, you know, how do you get that buy-in from the parents where they understand like, Hey, this is, this is part of our plan. And we need to have that trust. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, the team that I'm coaching, we're in a fortunate situation that these guys have been scrappers from a more pretty seasoned team. These kids have been wrestling from the youth age all the way through. I didn't always have that benefit, like coaching in Paso. You know, half your team would be kids that kind of came out for wrestling as freshmen that thought it would be fun and want to give it a try. <laughs> and yeah. so there's like this giant gap. You're trying to coach this kid that's been training his whole life and wants to be a state champion and trying to coach this kid that, just out here to have a good time and have some fun. And you're trying to find that happy medium for your program. Um, but the team we're coaching this year, I think we have a pretty strong buy-in from these guys. And I think everybody's excited about the team and the potential for it. And, uh, you know, we had a great performance last weekend. And so, but there's always things, man, between nutrition and between, you know, kids staying out late, and 
girlfriend problems. And those are things that, you know, the kids that I'm close with and I work with quite a bit, I have the relationship where I can talk to the parents about it. And shoot, I went up in the snack bar and I won't name names, but the mom was working the snack bar and I was like, I don't know what's wrong with your boy, but he looks like crap. And I was like, this is not what I expected out of him. We need, we need more. And I had a lot higher expectations. And he looks like he doesn't want to be here. And she's like, get on him. He needs it. And like, he take, he needs instruction. He needs somebody to, to grow. You need to tell him. And I'm like, well, I'm going to. <laughs> and so, um, you know, so when that relationship's strong enough and there's a mutual respect, I think, you know, a lot of these parents are like, whatever you got to do, I get messages all the time. If he's slacking, let me know or smack him up. And da, 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 you know. Yeah, when they say stuff. that, I'm like, can I get that in writing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can you sign a contract? <laughs> <and he's>, uh, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, overall, we have a real good group of kids and a group of parents. I mean, this it's, it's a fairly easy group to coach this year, to be honest with you. Um, we... We don't really ever have to talk. I mean, it reminds me of a college room intensity in a lot of ways. We don't have to talk about like working hard. We don't have to talk about not screwing around when you drill. It's just, it's intense. They're goers like all the time, which is, it's refreshing, man. <laughs> it's a refreshing team to coach for sure. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I feel like, um, you know, I've, I've coached at uh, two different high school teams, um, you know, and just, just from my personal experience, I, I, I feel like what makes coaching fun um, are not just like the big moments, but it's like the little things that you get to share with either, you know, the, the people on your team that you're coaching and then also the people that you get to coach with. Um, and then when you kind of are on the same page, like it makes things like so much smoother, like this was such a smooth weekend. Like, yeah, there were some ups and downs, you know, in terms of how we wrestled, um, like our performance, but, uh, I, I like just hanging out with our coaching staff. You know, I, I like the kids on our team. They're still doing silliness, but a lot of that's just because they're young and some of them are a little bit immature, but, um, I mean, how, I mean, what do you think about that? I just couldn't agree. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, if you were on social media before this, I did a post about it's the most wonderful time of the year, a little tag into like Christmas, but no, in reality, it's wrestling season. And so I was wiped out after coaching a whole tournament. We had, there was at one point, there was like four really intense matches against top ranked kids in the state. And like, I ran from Matt to Matt and coached all of them. I was like sweating and had a headache from yelling so much and um, shoot. And then there's other stuff like on the story, I got I got a picture of Frank Lomas holding my brother Mitch because Frank was a 125 pounder. Mitch is a heavyweight yeah. and he's holding him on his shoulders. And I posted it and I was like, back when Coach Frank was strong and used to like actually wrestle or something like that. And um, then he posted a picture of me walking with the backpack and I'm having to spray the mats to, <laughs> to clean it. <laughs> so, uh, called me Matt Mopper. And so, um, yeah, I, uh, man, it's fun. It's just fun to be out there. It's fun to see these kids achieve goals. I mean, we had a, we had a couple, there's a few really nice wins, but the one that really sticks out is Aiden Simmons. Um, his mom comes up to me and she's like, Matt, he's never beat this kid. And I'm like, well, today's the day. And uh, he wrestled that Macias. I think he's ranked like fifth in the state from Kingsburg. Uh, who is that? I think his name Leo Macias from Kingsburg. Yeah, from Kingsburg. He's ranked like fifth. Uh, yeah, he plays last year. That kid's tough. Yeah. And, and Simmons mopped him up. I mean, bad. It was eight to one, and the one point was a stall call. And we were like kind of a college ride where, post an elbow extended foot flattening them out and they just said we we're parallel so they called stall i just told them to stay with it like there was no reason to a stalling point or a stalling call wasn't going to hurt us so we just stuck on it we probably I think it was two takedowns to zero maybe three no two and then we had our escape and we had a near fall we put him on his back and uh, just a complete dominating performance for a kid that he had never beat before like on multiple occasions got beat by this kid so that was pretty dang exciting and um Honey's gone back and forth with Joe Buck and uh, controlled that match, two takedowns to zero, and uh, wrestled real tough. And then uh, we got, you know, the Priest boys, but Braden Priest um, is just so dang proud of him. He came, he was his first time competing in like a year and a half, coming off a shoulder injury. And he took a loss to Dario, but wrestled him pretty dang tough. There's some back and forth scraps. He was the Dario Lemus, the number one kid in the state. And then, um, wrestled and gutted out a really tough match against Perriman from Temecula. And so, uh, yeah, man, like you said, relationships with the coaches and our balance um, between the staff and then just the passion for the kids and to see them achieve, you know, see their hard work pay off. I mean, it's just the highs and lows are just amazing. You just don't get it coaching anything else. And like I said, I was wiped after. <laughs> I was so dang tired after that tournament. I keep making the joke that I'm not in coaching tournament shape yet. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, uh, it's this Wednesday, right? This Wednesday is the duel. What time does the duel start? I don't want to say it wrong. I'm going to check my messages while we're talking. It's either 6 or 6.30 is the varsity scheduled to start. Um, 
but I will. So it's closed. Are they bringing? Um, are they bringing their JV guys too? Like their back? Well, not their JV, but their backups and get extra. Yeah, we're gonna have like a. There's gonna be a JV duel as well as uh, the girls, and then um, the varsity. So let me see here. I have it in a text somewhere. So JV and girls are at four thirty, varsity at six. Okay. So, and then we were just, you know, we were the top two teams at our tournament, and it was a back and forth battle. And they had two starters out of their lineup that would have even. I mean, it looks like a forty point gap there in the tournament, but their eighty two pounder would have most yeah, likely uh, Hunter Hodges, not Hunter Hodges. It's, Tyler it's Hodges. Hodges. Uh, I think it's, it's Tyler Hodges. Yeah, it's Tyler. Hunter, yeah. Hunter uh, Hodges, the chess guy, yeah. <laughs> yep. And so, I mean, he would have without a doubt, probably been in the finals against Ty at 82s, so they would have got some more points there. And then their 220-pounder probably would have been in the finals against Murillo. Um, so, uh, yeah, who is that? Well, I don't remember his name exactly, because Marin, who was their it's Evan Marquez. So that's the guy who they have ranked on the on the California wrestler rankings. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, but they I had some other guys either, so... So that Mark Marin, who was a placer last year at 220s, he's at 95s this year, which that kind of surprises because I was expecting the matchup with him and Murillo at 220s, and it didn't happen. And so it's going to be a good duel, man. Like uh, Herrera uh, gutted out like a 2-1 win against their kid, and it was a heck of a match down to the down to the wire. Actually, there was no takedowns. We got a locking hands call, and then we got an escape, and then that kid had an escape, but it was – and they were going hard. And so there's going to be some repeat matches like that. Obviously, whoever Ty wrestles at 82s or 95s, it'll be the number one ranked kid in the state versus another top five, top six kid. Um, same thing. At yeah, well, they, didn't, they didn't send anybody um, at that weight, but uh, they have another guy who I think was their starter at 70s last year. Um, if Reyes ends up going 70s for the duels, uh, I think it's uh, Wyatt Merkford or something like that. Huh. Um, he, he'd be like, like, I think he said, like a top five or six guy, um, gotcha. probably at that weight too. Um, but uh, just looking at, like I did, did a little bit of research um, and just kind of looked at just the results from the tournament at the Rumble at the Rig and then um, kind of just went through the lineup. Uh, I think like on paper, um, just from like 106 to the heavyweights, I, I feel like it's probably going to be like a 7-7 seven, seven split and it's going to come down to bonus points. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be kind of a dogfight. I know like a lot of these Clovis guys, um, except for a couple of weights, are actually ranked at the weight below. Um, like I want to say uh, at 13s, you got Leonard Lewis and Jane Wren, who wrestled, uh, I think, 13s at the tournament. They made um, the finals, right? Ranked at the weight below. Um, which I think uh, I'm not sure if one of them would go down for 106 for a duel. I'd imagine but, they will. <laughs> yeah, I mean, who is the thing too? Like, I mean, for one, like, like props to Clovis, you know, uh, for taking this duel on. Like, they're coming down to a young, like, hungry uh, BHS team that that feels like I mean, you guys can win this duel. Um, you yeah. know, and that kind of they're putting their reputation and uh, you know. Um, so I think we on. have their lineup of what they're planning. So that was for. Let's see if this is it. You just got just big, uh, your 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 hats like all the way by the camera, and I just see oh. this Raider Nation logo. I didn't realize That's it was right. a Raider. You know, you got, got the shirt on. I just know it's the shirt too. Yeah, I mean they're playing right now. But... Your sidebar for a sec. Why? So why? How are you a Raiders fan? Uh, born into it, but uh, there's some good history there. So Daryl LaMonica, who. Um, I don't know if you know, he went to Clovis High School and the, their stadium's named after La Monica Stadium. My grandma went to high school at the same time as him there. And so from that, just became a, a Raider fan. And then my dad wore a Raider hat every for every birth, both myself and my two brothers. And like, yeah. it turned into like a joke that that's because we wanted boys, right? We want football players and wrestlers. <laughs> and so then I wore it both the same hat, like this old grungy <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't even look like that. Yeah, you got baptized basically to be a Raider. Yeah, and so I wore both of my boys are born. My brother's worn it. Both of his boys are born. So we've only had boys for like the last couple generations. Just we'll see if my youngest brother doesn't screw it up. And uh, <laughs> so we're, you know, hey, I don't. It's frustrating to be a Raider fan at sometimes, but it's a life. It's a lifelong commitment. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, back back to the duel. Um, yeah, I was trying. That's why I was looking down, by the way, as I was looking, because I believe I have their projected lineup that they kind of passed on to us, which they have extras because they're going to bump and move around a little bit. 
Well, they got so they got a, a couple guys wrestling thirteens. They also had a couple guys wrestling twenties, and not Zinkin, but I can't remember the other guy. Uh, yeah. he had to be at third or something. I thought Zinkin. I thought at two weights in a row. I thought at thirteens and twenties they wrestled each other. So at third. Oh, that that was it. It was. Uh, Maybe you're right. I mean, you were there. I wasn't there. I'm pretty sure because I think I remember seeing uh, I was talking to Adam for a bit and then he called over Zinkin, uh, his, his, the kid Zinkin on his team. And he was upset about, I think, how the finals match went. Then I think he wrestled one. It was a close match with his teammate. And um, so then, like, they had to talk and I just walked away. But uh, I'm pretty sure both those weight classes, they wrestle each other. So I'd imagine one of their better 13 batters is going to make sixes for the duel. And I'd imagine they're probably going to work those other two couple kids in the lineup around 20, at 20s and 26s to put their best duel team together. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, on paper, I think um, it might be good for them to maybe bump somebody up. Mm -hmm. um, especially, I mean, I don't know. I don't know why they didn't bring their 82 pounder if he was hurt or what. Um, but that, I mean, that could, that yeah, could, Adam told me he split his eye open pretty bad and then kind of missed a week of practice because he kept busting open and bleeding. And then, um, so just decided to let it fully heal and get him ready. For the, so he'll be here for the duel. Um, yeah. And then, uh, I don't remember what happened to 220 pounder. I think, I think he wrestled, I don't have the results from it, but I think he wrestled at Chuck Chancey, um, because of, 20? yeah, because of something going on. I don't, I don't know the whole story, but I think they sent him there. Well, he Maybe. didn't make the, he didn't make the finals. Um, that Highland and uh, a Pittman kid made the finals, and there were some fireworks. So, oh nice! Like one kid like shoved another kid into the table, and then uh, at the other kid won and like pushed his head down. The other kid came up, didn't like that, like punched him in the back of the head. I kind of uh, I heard the table thing happen, and I was charging my phone because we were getting ready for the drive, and it was the finals. So I'm like, oh, I'm watching now. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Yeah. So, yeah, like I said, man, I, we marked it on our calendar when we scheduled it. And um, something I'm big on is I really want dual meets. I think it's the it's the best fan experience for um, in for the sport of wrestling. And it's the way to build your sport and way for people that want to support you to get to see it. Because nobody that's just a kind of like knows a kid or kind of wants to check it out, wants to come sit at a tournament all day and wait and see when kids are going to wrestle throughout the day and they have three or four matches. Um, so to come to a dual in a high level competitive duel across the board where there's probably going to be, I'd venture to guess out of the 14 weight class, like 10 of them that are barn burner matches that could go either way. Um, where like, it's not like somebody's heavily favored over the other. Um, so a lot of intensity in a small gym that gets really loud and um, two of the most, you know, historically successful programs in the state of California history. And so um, I'm looking forward to it. I think duels are a lot of fun. Yeah, if I uh, if I don't end up having a time conflict, I'll probably come over there and check it out. And cool. uh, yeah, part of it part of it's just you know yeah I want to see uh, just how how guys are wrestling, but it's also a fan like a fan perspective, you know. Yeah. Like, uh, you know I uh, man freaking um, I had Big Ten Plus, and the dang thing wasn't popping up on my uh, the Iowa Iowa State duel wasn't popping up for a live event, and they I wasn't sure if Big Ten had like a scheduling issue because it yeah. said that the duel was going to be on the tenth on the actual Big Ten oh, Plus. Okay. So I'm like trying to scramble to find how to watch the dang duel and FUBU, some like TV thing. Uh, I paid like 60 bucks, dude, like so dang. I can watch Big Ten Network. And Did watch you get it though? Network. Huh? You got on it though? Yeah, I got on it. I wasn't happy about, you know, paying the 60 bucks, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm a fan and I wanted to watch the duel. So Yeah, we um, watched, Ty and I sat in the living room and watched the whole thing. So um, it was interesting emotions back and forth on individuals that I wanted to win and not to win just because of the way they carried themselves and their style of wrestling. Like so I was like, uh, I mean, a little, I mean, not that it's like, I take it personal, but a little bit close home just because I kind of know the backstory on it. I won't get into it, but uh, like real woods, who just left Stanford to Iowa. Like he wins like a four, two match and he's like pounding his chest and showing like the Hawks thing and like showing his sleeve to like, Iowa. it's his like leg symbol, the logo to Iowa state. And I just, didn't like that a lot um the 97 pounder with like warner during the match sticking his tongue out and you know yeah doing all you know all that i i wanted him to lose <laughs> it was funny going in the match it's like i don't really like warner's style like he doesn't really do a lot and i'm saying the kind of root for the other kid and then afterwards i was just like by midway through the match i was wanting the i wanted warner to win <laughs> and so and it was cool watching mj gaton um 
I didn't know he was going to wrestle. And he pops out and mad against yeah. brands. And him and Ty wrestled each other probably five, six times growing up through like youth and junior high. And then they were always end up being different weights, but always see the dad and talk to him and, you know, always like the kid and the family. And, um, so it was cool to get to watch him wrestle. And he's just so dangerous and so funky, but I think he's going to have to be a little more solid if he wants to see success at the college level. I, I was never a fan of like his overtie uh, shuck throw by thing that he would do. Um, I remember, uh, I can't remember the guy he wrestled from. Was it um, St. John Boston? No, it was Calvary. Um, yeah. And like, dude, you're just pulling this guy into your dang leg. Like, how yeah. often is this, you know, going to happen? Um, I'm not a big fan of overtie stuff. Uh, yeah. The way that way that I've seen it done by a lot of high schoolers, because they just place that hand instead of like, you know, getting your elbow down and taking away that collar tie. Um but uh, yeah, also too, like every time he get taken down, he go to his back. And like, trying to these button, like high wire and do like elevators and kickovers, and it just doesn't work against good wrestlers. So. You try it yeah. once, you know, it doesn't work. Okay, maybe you should not stick with that, you know, that uh, high risk move. I agree. I agree. I, I like I said, rooting for the kid, want him to do well, but I think he's going to have to clean up his uh, his positioning and his fundamentals. And I'm a big guy of. I don't know if it's considered old school, but fundamentally sound of beating guys inside and always fighting to have the inside tie and the control. I believe the guy that's got the inside most of the time has the majority of the control of the position. And uh, I think he's constantly giving up the, the, the better position. And so hopefully he yeah. figures it out. And I'm sure he will. So they, they got a really good staff, really good program. So. Well, man, we've been going for almost an hour. Uh, I just got a couple more questions, um, and then I, I, we can definitely talk about doing this again too because I think it's been fun. Yeah, it was, um, fun. It was fun. So for one, so you did it. You were a dual sport athlete. You did football. You did wrestling. Um, maybe talk about the importance of, or if you think it's important, um, of being able to do multiple sports in high school, especially since, and this has been talked about a lot. I feel like you see a lot of kids specializing in one thing. <laughs> But when you do that one thing over and over and over again, sometimes it can lead to injuries, like more likelihood of injury. And you see that with um, you know, a lot of the Iowa guys. Uh, I don't know if that's direct, directly causation, but shoulder injuries and knee braces and stuff like that. But you also see like freshmen coming in like Swiderski and Panera Johnson and, guys, and MJ Gaten, like they can come in and they can wrestle right away. Um, so yeah. maybe from your experience, both as an athlete, as a coach, uh, and you've coached two sports, you know, yep. two high school sports. So maybe talk about the pros and cons of each and, and your thoughts on that. So a couple of spots where I've seen a ton of it, like AAU basketball, these kids are playing hundreds and hundreds of games and they're starting to have like real injuries to like their feet and their knees. I mean, you're just wearing and the jumping and the landing and stuff all the time. Um, there's a guy I follow that I just respect immensely. He's got some great content and uh, strength training and then, um, he like developmental programs for youth and so he kind of has a model that he believes like some form of sprinting some form of uh you know gymnastics he also thinks like swimming and a few of these things are really important at a young age because there's a the fact that matters if you only do say you only wrestle there are there are motor skills that you are not developing like there are things that you don't do in wrestling that you do in other sports that you need to develop and i believe specializing too young you know, one, there's, you know, the things that burn out, there's the, the aspect of injuries, but also when it's all said and done at the, at the very end, at the top, you look at the guys who win an NCAA titles and whatnot, it's the best athletes. And so like your learning curve gets so much better as you get further along into high school and then college. So these guys that are trying to specialize at a young age, um, they get caught up on the skill set aspect pretty quick. Like Ty's never wrestled year round in his entire life. Like he's going to make some really big jumps spending a year at Stanford. Uh, under those guys and work out those guys. he's gonna you know become a lot more dynamic and um but he's also gonna have an advantage athletically from an explosiveness standpoint from the sprinting and the you know balance of staying on his feet when people are trying to tackle him um you know just everything else you get from all these others was hand-eye coordination footwork uh so i am just a, and i don't care what sport I'm just a gigantic proponent of playing multiple sports. I'm also a proponent of being a kid and enjoying your high school experience and uh, being able to look back on it and that you had fun and you did everything you could. Um, and if you're really committed, you can do both. So um, you can be good at both. You can continue to strength train year round. You can slip in some drilling sessions and some workouts through another sport. Um, I, I believe in it. It'll, it'll never change. I think, uh, you know, the two sports that we're 
kind of heavily focused on football. Playing football makes you a better wrestler, and being a wrestler makes you a better football player. And uh, yeah, Tycom, I mean, Tycom's right out of football, and you know, not on the mat for three and a half, four months, and it takes about a week or two to get his timing back, and then you know, conditioning's a big thing. He's dying, he's dying the first you know week or two, and then you're off and running. And he's refreshed and excited about it as opposed to like, hey, I haven't even really stopped since last year and I'm this is all I do. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so I think like Chad Wesley Smith thing, he wants like three or four sports at a young age and do them all and develop all these motor skills. And you know, you get the gymnastics and the body control or the flexibility and the body control from like a gymnastics. Sprinting is like the one activity you can do that's like absolute maximal force and maximal effort that uh, you know, for explosiveness and and then um, he likes swimming, which isn't something I have my boys. But like Carson, he's in wrestling three days a week, and he's doing tumbling the other couple of days a week to develop um, those skill sets. Tied to gymnastics at a young age. And then I believe by like junior high, he narrowed down to maybe three, three or two is kind of his philosophy. And then high school, uh, one or two, and then you're specializing post post high school um, in your one sport if you're lucky enough to compete at the college level. And so yeah, I believe in something fairly similar to that. And uh, and it's, it's kind of work. It's worked for us. I mean, we, I sent a picture to Cole and Enoch of Ty. Ty's rocking a mustache. Uh, Cause he, he's had a, yeah, I saw that, man. I saw that. So, <laughs> so he rocked the stash. And so we were making jokes about having fun with it. And I sent a picture to those guys and just um, said rocking the stash. And they're like, man, he is just slapped together. Cause he's, he's ripped up, shredded, straight, trained real hard. And, and Enoch writes back athlete. And you can see, you know, he's been, He's ran hills for football and, you know, he's been sprinting for the last four or five months and those things just translate into a very fast explosive shot. You know, it's a double leg, you know, um, heavy sprawls and quick feet. So nobody could ever convince me otherwise that it's a mistake to specialize in one sport at, a, at too early of an age. Yeah. Uh, do you feel like uh, towards the end of the season you're going to get that mustache going and shave all the rest of this off? That was kind of the talk. If, if Ty's going to rock it all year long, uh, uh, the coaches were discussing rolling into like the state meet with mustaches. And then, I don't know, I might feel crazy and do the Fu Manchu, but we'll see. <laughs> well, I, so I, I, shaved, uh, I, sh I shaved Thursday, and um, I had this for a little bit, just this right here. Yeah. And uh, this was I was actually kind of excited because my beard actually looks full now, like a little bit. Oh, there um, you go. I just kind of have to grit, grit through it a little bit until it grows out long enough. Uh, so I'm excited about that. So, so fortunately, um, the timing is I think going to line up where by the time I can actually fully grow in a beard, my hair is going to be really thin and I'm just going to go bald and I'll have the beard and it'll work out. That's what I've always said, man. If the hair starts going up top to where it's thin enough, I'm, it's just, it's going bye-bye. I notice shaved head beard for sure. <laughs> um, I do like what you said though, about, uh, you know, just, just making sure the kids have a good experience. You know, and it's like you want to be competitive and you want to win. And I think like if you want to win in high school, uh, yeah, maybe maybe you do just, you know, put in all these extra hours and you'd be really focused and, you know, you, you do all this extra stuff. But a lot of these kids like, you know, they want to do other things or, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, why are you forcing them to choose one thing or the other? Uh, because the big thing is just you don't want high school to go by. And when you look back on it, to have any regrets. Um, that was actually uh, my junior year. I actually broke a rib. Uh, so I broke my wrist playing football and I was actually supposed to quit. I was I thought about quitting football uh, before that. And I was like, I'm going to stay. And part of that was some personal stuff, but I broke my wrist like on, uh, just on a false start, dude. Mm. I was in the backfield and I was supposed to block and the guy came in and we kind of went through the motions. We bumped, I broke my wrist. Great. And then uh, towards the end of the year, uh, I got thrown on my back and I freaking uh, broke a rib in the back. So I'm out for like, uh, may, I don't know, maybe like a month of like, you know, and that's a few weeks of just not really doing too much and then slowly just drilling. And I didn't go live for the rest of the year. Um, but uh, I when I was out, the musical auditions just happened to be around the same time. And I'm like, I don't know. And then my buddies were like, you should do it. You should try it, like whatever. And then it ended up being like a great experience. And I met a bunch of people that I wouldn't have normally met. Um, mm -hmm. So we've been talking a lot about, about sports, but like, you or Ty, like, you guys, like, anything else, like, other than sports stuff? Like, do you play an instrument that we don't know about? I don't. Um, you know, I'm, I would be, I guess I'd say I'm, like, the typical jock in a lot of ways. <laughs> so, yeah. we follow a ton of sports and watch them. Um, Ty's really into music. He's, like, always got an earpiece in. He's always listening to something. Um, but, uh yeah, no. I mean, we're, we 
I so the other thing that like I really have a love for and a passion for is just strength training and lifting. Yeah. So I have like 15 of like the best strength training programs or the guy like the most established guys in the world that I've read and uh have switched from program to program throughout the years and molded my own programs. And so I love to strength train um just personally and then I like to get kids strong and um I like, you know, like feeling strong. So I put, I put a lot of time into that. And then, man, when you're raising a family and you're getting your own workouts in and you have a couple of practices most afternoons and uh, you work during the day, there's not always that much time for other stuff. But, uh, you know, just a big family. My, my family's real close. So when we're all together. We play card games and, you know, mess around. But like I said, it turns into wrestling matches. And I like to have some adult beverages from time to time. And so we have a good time. That's awesome, man. All right. I got one final question. Uh, and then when, when I can let you go. Um, so on your LinkedIn page, you have uh, Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpens iron as one person sharpens another. Um, I'm mm. guessing you like that. I think it sounds good. Like, you know, maybe speak about uh, why you have that on your LinkedIn page and, you know, how does that maybe affect your, your personal philosophy? What does that mean to you? Yeah. So to take it a step further, I have that tattooed on my chest as well. Um, there used to be an eternal warrior camp out in uh, Montana and my youngest brother went to it. Mark Munoz worked it and um, was, you know, I know like Jay Robinson's camps get a lot of uh, notoriety for how tough they were, but I believe this camp was right up there with it is one of the toughest, I think two weeks, maybe 10 days or two weeks. And um, you're out in the middle of nowhere. You're, you know, you're swimming miles, you're running distance for miles, you're running up a hill with, they assign you a log based on your size when you go into it and then you're wrestling multiple times a day and then there's, you know, there's scripture involved with it and um, uh, Bible studies and whatnot. But they had a pretty cool logo. It's like a cross and then there's like in the center there's like a circle right at the center of the cross and it's like the wrestling symbol, like a guy like throwing another guy and then I have like the ribbon across the bottom of the cross that has that, that, uh, that verse and um I mean, I couldn't believe it. I, I believe in it as immensely, completely. I believe in it, you know, who, who you surround yourself with and who you grind with on a daily basis. And, um, you know, something I, I preach constantly to kids that I coach is when you catch them kind of going easy on each other or they're, um, you know, you're drilling shot defense and your kids are taking a crappy shot because they're not drilling the shot. They're letting the guy drill his, his sprawl. Um, I'll always circle back to that quote and, uh, you know, if you truly love this person that you're drilling with, we're supposed to be a family or a team. If you care about them, you're going to give them your very best every single day. And if your very best is a beat down for them, then you're going to make them better. You just sharpen them up a little bit. And uh, so it's something that I, I use, I take that approach in pretty much everything I do. Um, you know, shoot, when I lift with another person, you know, Reed, we lift and he's strong as heck. And we seem to always be a little bit strong when we're lifting together because there's a little bit of a competition and you know, yeah. pushing each other. And, uh, you know, I try to get myself into shape and I train myself up going into wrestling season because Ty's gotten to a point where if I'm like wrestling him and I'm not trying to use my size and my strength and we're going back and forth because, you know, I'm quite a bit heavier than him, I get tired. <laughs> he pushes <laughs> it and, he, and he's turned into a young man and he wants it. And uh, so, but with that being said, I felt like, I need to be at a certain level to be able to keep improve him, keep improving, keep getting tougher and better. And so, um, yeah, man, iron sharpens iron. You know, it's, it's as true as it can be. And, um, you know, he's hearing most things that you're only as you know good as the six or seven people around you. And you yeah. see so often, like in the high school state meet results, there's like a, a state champ at 152s and then the 160 pounders like four. And it's because he was the workout partner of the state champ. And he got really good by working out with that kid every single day. And he just happened to be the next best kid in the room for that partner for the best kid in the room. And uh, so, yeah, I think it's uh, non-negotiable how true that statement is, how true that Bible verse is. And uh, that's how yeah. we grow life. I love that verse a lot. And I like, um, I like talking about, you know, stuff like that, like team related things with wrestling. And, um, you know, I, I think some people believe that wrestling is an individual sport, which I think it's, yeah, it's obviously has an individual emphasis, you know, there's an individual state champion, but there's also a team mm -hmm. title, you know, and uh, kind of like how you just mentioned, like if, if you're somebody that's really tough in the room, well, that's only because you have really good workout partners too. You know, and, and there's coaches that go into that. There's parents that go into that. There's administration that goes into that. 
And it's uh, when you define what a program is, it's a mix of all these different people that are working together for a goal. So I, I really like that proverb a lot. And uh, maybe I'll talk about that with my guys tomorrow. So. Yeah, I mean, I uh, speaking to workout partners and all that, I mean, that's that's how I really got into like all this coaching fully. And I had to learn that the hard way. So here's Ty, who's four or five years old and wanted to get him wrestling. And there's no real club around. Like there was one that kind of had a few kids and then you can go down the road for another few, but nothing that was like, what was needed for him and to get to level one. So it's like, that was back my club that it's still going. Um, some other people run it, but I left it when I moved over to Big Soul at Smash Mouth Wrestling Club. I basically started that club because like, I got to have workout partners for Ty if I'm going to coach him. Like I, I can't do anything with him, you know, at, when he's that small. And uh, so that's how Smash Mouth, my wrestling club over there and everything got started was just trying to create a, a situation where my son had workout partners and then it turned into something all of a sudden you're 60 80 kids three years in and you're competing at the state meets and uh um yeah if you don't have workout partners you're not getting to the sport is what it comes down to so all right man well um i'm, I'm glad we got to have fun and, and you came on and talk um we talked about some really good things uh wednesday is the clovis versus you almost said buchanan Clovis versus, dude, I, in my head, I was like, don't say Buchanan. And I said Buchanan. Clovis versus Bakersfield High School um, at Bakersfield High School at 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Start. varsity starts. All right, man. Uh, anything you want to say? Any final words? No, thanks for having me on, man. It's always always fun talking to you and uh, somebody that shares the same passions as me. So it's a good time. All right, brother. All right, buddy. We'll talk to you. All right.